Uh, my name is Susan Polterman. Um, I've been a longtime volunteer for the park. It was a changing thing for me. Everyone in my family, I'll answer Gail's question, everyone in my family from my mother who had a master's in biology, my father who had his doctorate in uh, agronomy, my brother who has two doctorates, one in biology and botany, two sisters that have their master's in biology, and I had no clue what I wanted to do until I started volunteering for the park. And then I went, this is where, this is what I want to know about. And I actually got really lucky. My brother, who is retired now, living in Puerto Rico, just came up last month and we went on a botanical tour of Florida. And it was really, really nice. I had never been to the Lake Wales area. <laughs> if you do get there, it is the highest place in Florida. It is. The, it was originally the only island, you know, and the rest of Florida was gone. It was underwater. And it was an island just sitting there. And I don't know if you guys know this. This is pretty interesting. I, don't, I didn't know it until recently. All of Florida, aside from the Florida Keys, because we're so young, you know, not millions of years old, just 250,000 years old. Um, all of the rest of Florida is a plateau of remainders of the oldest mountain range in the world, which is the Appalachians. Appalachian. So all that, that little <laughs> island, all that sand in there is little pieces of quartz from the Appalachian Mountains so long ago. But even if you go to Everglades National Park and all very a long way out into the Gulf, like 150 miles west into the Gulf, is all part of that plateau, which was from the Appalachian Mountains. So, okay, now I've managed to pour you this much. <laughs> Let's just take a little walk. But I want to point out these two trees, first of all, um, because they're here. Um, <laughs> These two trees are your wild tamarind. They're two of the considered the pioneer species after your mangroves. The first trees, and you can, one reason they are the first ones is every plant we have, except for four species of vines, comes from the Greater Antilles in the West Indies. Was he going south or was he headed back north? What, what is here isn't anywhere else. So if you were to go anywhere else east of the Rockies, all those plants shifted to great changes. There were subtropical plants and tropical plants up in the north of Canada. There have been, you know, freezing cold plant, plants that are, you know, deciduous, deciduous trees all the way down into South Florida. The Keys are not old enough to have gotten all that. So by the time the Keys started forming, all the plants that came here came from the West Indies and the Greater Antilles, either through the Gulf Stream or the trade winds. But one reason our trees don't live as long, like you have, there are trees in Nevada that live for 5,000 years. There's trees in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, that are 300, 400, 500 years old. These trees never get to take a nap. They, it, they are on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, try, you know, fighting off the pathogens and insects and everything else that are attacking the trees. So they, they don't have that long life. 52,000 years ago, we would be standing 50, uh, two, uh, 20 feet under the water. So the, we would have been a coral reef happily, you know, feeding fish and everything else. And but then as the waters dropped, your mangroves moved in. And this is a red mangrove that's all these trees here that have the knobs and the, and the uh, prop roots. These are your red mangroves. This is one thing that makes mangroves different from other trees is that they have seedlings on the tree. These, this is not a seed or a fruit or a seed pod like you would see on a plant, every other plant, this is actually a viable tree right here, right in your hand. And if you put it into a thing of water, leaves would pop out of it. Why is it not growing out here? Is because all plants have a relationship with the plants. You don't realize that roots have this relationship with each other. They support each other, they share mycorrhizae, and mangroves don't want to have anything to do with it. 
when they're out here, they're amongst other plants that can only tolerate salt and aren't a problem for them. So that's why they live in the salt water. They could easily live on, in, on the ground, but other plants can too that they wouldn't have that great relationship with. So anyway, this little tree could have floats along in the water, could be 10 feet, could be 10,000 miles. Mangroves exist around the globe. And they'll find, the water was dropping, a little niche and they'll stick in the niche, start developing roots, the leaves start out, and a mangrove can drop a ton, a mature mangrove, a ton of leaves a year. So all the original soil started right here with your red and black mangrove. As you notice, almost everywhere you look, you'll see a yellow leaf, and that's that one drops, the next one turns yellow, that one drops, the next one turns yellow. And so these are, mangroves are so important because they hold back storm waters. See, I don't know if you've been to the Everglades while you were here, but if you get down around anywhere from Westlake South, you'll see how the mangroves are just void. They're dead. And it's because if you break off their terminal leaf, they can't grow back and they die. But their roots are still there. They're still wood and they're still holding back water until these little guys grow into trees again. If you go to Long Key State Park, which is a lovely state park, it's kind of just got some really unusual plants in it. You will see when you go over the boardwalk, the whole thing's dead, but you will also see mangroves and new stuff coming up. So this is a buttonwood fruit. And this, whoops, I'll try and do it before it falls apart. How about this one? So the reason why these are all seeds, the reason why it's called buttonwood is back in the days when women had those shoes that you laced up, that was what a button looked like. So that's where it got its name. Buttonwood is also really cool because it has, it's wood is very, it makes a very um, refined charcoal, one that they would use for explosives. So they'd pay some Bahamian man to sit over a fire for 48 hours to make this perfect charcoal. And this was all what was once farmland, which was now becoming extremely useless because the dirt was all going away. You know how you have a garden up north and rocks keep appearing in your garden and it's like where do these rocks that I keep throwing out come from and it's not that the rocks are rising it's that the dirt is going away. Speaking so, of rocks I don't you might want to take a quick look at the these are all oh. Carl this is all Carl look at this beautiful piece right here. We have this dry forest because these guys have to live on the little tiny bit of water that is retained in that. So these trees that you're all seeing, this one, this one, this one, that one, these are all poison woods. Because of the damage that was in her, no, this is a red mangrove. You can see it's prop roots. So these are not looking as ideal as you would like them to be to identify them because oh. Um, because these trees, after Irma, these trees are fighting to get their canopy back. If, you, if our trees had rings, which they don't, but if our trees had rings, the rings would be tightly, tightly packed because these guys are just struggling to grow up and not out as most trees would. But ways to identify it is the peeling bark, the black on it, but as you can see, you're not seeing the beautiful rust color that you would normally see because these guys are making a big effort. So therefore, I say to you, don't just grab a tree randomly. If you don't know what it is, just leave it alone. Now, don't feel like because you're out here, you're gonna get poison wood. If you feel that you tripped and you accidentally leaned up against the tree, just wash them with friction and soap preferably without lanolin. It's an oil. And it's that same oil, it's that same chemical, urushiol, that's in mango and pistachio, poison ivy, poison oak, 
poison sumac. It's all that same chemical. So, um, but they all are slightly different. Like I can peel a mango with no problem, but get fierce poison ivy. Uh, you know, so there's, you know, they're all just slightly different. To many people, this is one of the worst. So this right here is your Jamaican dogwood, which is considered the third of the three pioneer species I told you about. They also have papery, papery seed pods, which fly through the air and became, came to here. But you can see how the leaves have a very matte finish. See how it's not shiny at all? Now you have, this is poison wood. See the same thing, compound leaves, three to seven leaflets. But if you notice the black spots on them, that's some of the sap, or often they don't have the black spots. What else do they have? See how their midrib and their outer margin is paler? Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell the difference. All, none of these have that pale yellow, yellowish midrib and margin. So don't touch her stick. The margin is the outer rim of the leaf. <laughs> and this was, the people, this is a small version. You can see there's lots of them. And it's a green version. They would probably use the yellow. These people were desperately poor. I mean, you're talking about people that were trying to, you know, grow vegetables. And farmers have never been rich people, especially when you're talking to your own little farm. So what they would do is they would carve their letter. They didn't have pen and paper. They would carve out what they wanted to write to their family, and they would take this to the mailbox and or the post office, and they would mail these as letters. This is your Spanish stopper, the one that had the football-shaped leaves. And this is actually a great tree for putting orchids on. For some reason, orchids and Spanish stoppers also, buttonwoods and Spanish stoppers, I mean, not orchids, are just like cows. This Jamaican dogwood is the larval host plant for that butterfly. And as you can see, see where this is folded over? They start with a little one like that, and then when they grow older, they get to a bigger one, and then they do this, and eventually, if you open it up, you'll find the big caterpillar, and then it goes on to become the butterfly. Now people ask me, why do we keep poison wood? Every island country has gotten rid of their poison wood. What is the matter with us that we have these dangerous trees? And I say to them, because we have this fabulous bird, it's called a white crowned pigeon, on the large side of pigeon. It, uh, it's very dark gray to black, and it has like a white yarmulke on its head. And it is an endangered because they fly back and forth from the Bahamas, and then in the Bahamas, it's still legal to shoot them for sport. They mm. don't even eat them. So poison wood fruits in the summer when the white crown pigeons have their young, and the white crown pigeons, I mean, this their fruit is very high in lipids, which is fat, and that's how they grow to be, you know, on their own quickly. So that's why we keep our poison woods. When people say, well, I don't know whether I should put a poison wood in your yard. Don't put a poison wood in your yard. There is plenty of conservation lands with plenty of poison wood. Another thing that you can see about the molly is there is a very lot of lichen on it. There's this, this, this. There's all these lichens are very common to see on a molly. Now, if you were to see one of these by the highway, it would have no lichen on it because lichen cannot survive by pollution. I'm, I'm good. Thanks. So anyways. you know you're in a fresh area when you see lichen. Anything on any lichen exists on every. You know, it's everywhere. It's in the coldest places. It's in the hottest places. It's in the lowest places. It's in the highest places. But it is not in New York City, Beijing, or L.A. <laughs> If you had been here two and a half years ago, before Hurricane Irma, we would not be seeing the sky. We would be seeing leaves and, you know what I mean? It would be a whole nother ball game. It was a bad storm. Well, Key West hardly got anything because they were on the good side. We were just on the bad side. I clocked winds many, 
lot of wind at 130 miles an hour. Wow. I lost a lot of trees in my yard, and as you can see, a lot here. And you're here in Mark on Kibana. Yeah, uh, two, two miles down the road, yes. Mm -hmm. So it makes it very convenient. This tree, is this spectacular tree, is different from every other tree because you can see this beautiful foliage. Um, it has tasty fruit. I fight the birds for the fruit. <laughs> this is black ironwood. This is the hardest wood in North America. So if you were to cut off this piece right here and drop it in the water, it would sink. Anyway, the problem with this is if you try and shake it, you can barely move it. So in a storm where all these trees, the trunks are supporting each other, and then when the wind switches, they're supporting each other, this guy can't do that. So this is the tree that you see with the most broken branches because they broke because they couldn't move, they snapped. But you can see here what has happened during the storm, and you'll see it on many of the species of trees. See these little shoots that are coming out of the trunk? They did that so that they could photosynthesize, somehow fight their way back. And the ones that have still have them on there are now having the problem of, because it hasn't really developed its canopy, the problem is, is the xylem and phloem on this tree are interrupted by these branches that come out the side. So it's sort of a two-phase thing. You hope they can develop the canopy so those branches, you know, will fall off and it will be a healthy tree again. It is, this tree is really fighting. And the problem with what's going on with this hammock is people don't realize the communication that goes on with trees. There is the things that the mycorrhizae and the fungi that relates with the tree that helps them along the way. Because there were trees that fell, the other trees are going, where is that, those nice roots and that mycorrhizae that I had before? So this year alone, Two years after the storm, we have lost six large trees in here that have fallen because of, oh, look what we got oh. here. Ooh, that's a swallowtail. giant swallowtail. That's our largest butterfly. And it's beautiful. And it is cousin to an endangered species that we have here that Neil and I hunt for every year for three months out of the year from April to June called the Shao Swallowtail. Because of the storm, see, it's, things benefit. Their larval host plant, which is very slow growing compared to everybody else, all of a sudden has light and has been shooting up all this new growth. And so this year we saw more than four times the amount of shouse we'd seen before that, 431. So it was pretty exciting for an endangered species, which when I first started doing them, I don't know, eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, we never saw any for three years, none. So we're gonna, I really, we are really gonna go for a stroll, I promise, but I had to point out these two important trees, your black mangrove and your gumbo limbo, because they are just so special. <laughs> no, 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 black ironwood. Ironwood. And then here, ah. these are all gumbo limbos. All gumbo limbo. That is poison wood right there. That is poison wood right there. So gumbo limbo has a unique distinction in the United States of being the only wood in North America, the only tree, that can photosynthesize through its bark. Mm. Oh, See the green yeah. under the red? Yeah. Oh, wow. When it drops all of its leaves in the wintertime, when it gets really dry, this thing is still creating sugars and converting carbon dioxide into oxygen just through their bark. It's pretty cool. It's also Gumbo extremely Gumbo. lightweight. It is almost as lightweight as balsa wood, but it has a greater tensile strength. So they used to be able to use, they would carve it into, they say, carousel horses, I imagine tables, anything else that would, and it's very soft. If you were to pick up a piece of wood, you know, you'd be expecting something heavy to go like this. Your hand automatically goes like this because it's so light. Um, it is also in the Bursaraceae family which two other things in the Bursaraceae family are frankincense and myrrh. Mm -hmm. So you're, this is a perfect time around Christmas to introduce that because that's what your wise men carried. I don't know if you know, frankincense was used for as an incense and myrrh was used in the embalming process. Well, I think it was the mummification process, actually. Oh, oh that's a long wing. And
And that nice. is our state butterfly. And I have to tell you about that butterfly. It's so magnificent. Besides its beautiful flight, um, it is one of the longest living butterflies. They, there are two other butterflies that on occasion live longer, but these are actually living, flying, not sleeping the whole time. And the reason is they eat. All other butterflies nectar. These guys nectar and while they're at it, they collect pollen on their proboscis and they eat that. And they can live from six to eight months. Okay. So where they, there is like one in a thousand monarchs make that whole trip down to Mexico by themselves. But it's not, it's not really fair to say, well, they're the longest living butterflies if they don't all live a long time. And often see our endangered tree snails. So if you see one, please, point it out to everybody because they are rare and it is something you're seeing that other people would never get to see. And there we go, there's our Julia. Mm -hmm. Ooh, see that bright orange? Nice oh, orange. Bright orange. Beautiful. The bright orange one, that's your male Julia. Julia? Julia. And yes, Julia, like Julia. Julia. But people go, well, how can a male butterfly be a Julia? It actually comes from the Latin name Iulia, which is actually male. So then what do you tell the penis? Yeah, the pigeon plum trees that we see all around us, those are the winter fruit for the white crown pigeon. So this, these little trees, and you see them sort of all around here, and if you really shake them right, anyway, this is white stopper. Remember I told you about root? the Spanish stopper that had football shaped leaves. White stopper and Spanish stopper in the same family. What is the largest killer of people in third world countries? Dysentery dehydration from dysentery. They're called stoppers because they'd make a bark tea out of it and it would act like an old time emodium AD. Yeah. We have a lot of really valuable woods for um, our lignum vitae, for example, was used in shipbuilding. And I know the reason on that one is because it exudes a resin so it's that naturally. is self-lubricating, yeah. so it stays fresh. Uh -huh. So that's our lignum vitae. They used it in shipbuilding a lot. Um, these things are so small that when I looked at it through a microscope, the lady had this, the girl who was writing her dissertation on these wasps, had one of those needles, you know, that you have in a needle kit that's so mm -hmm. small you wonder how in the world can anybody use this. It's got such a little hole you figure it could never fit a thread. She had one of those needles underneath that microscope and it looked like this. <laughs> and those wasps were minuscule underneath of that. So hmm. they are really tiny and they're full of vitamins and vitamins and minerals. So Ooh. don't feel like protein. You're eating something <laughs> big. So are you so saying when big. I eat a fig newton, Susan, that I might be eating wasps? You're not might be eating wasps. You, you are, are eating wasps. Well most most anything in the ma <laughs> in the mammal world anything men big. are sorry to tell you this. Men are, or males are the alpha species. Whereas in the insect, generally, in the insect world, it is quite the reverse. Playing praying mantis, wife biting off her husband's head, spiders, spiders eat their them. males. Well, the female wasps, the reason why the wasps are so important is every other one of these plants has an exterior flower. Figs have an interior flower. So your bees and your butterflies can't pollinate it. So the flowers inside, the, the males go in, the female comes in, does her business, Wait, takes that off. that looks dirty. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's no kids here. So anyway, she takes off and those wasps eventually, you know, they do their pollination. Don't worry, those seeds you're crunching on are not wasps. Oh, those are, are the wasps. seeds. Those are the <laughs> pollinated, now become fruit, inside the fruit. But um, I thought that's just a little interesting thing. What's really interesting is there's over 180 varieties of fig, ficus, throughout ficus. the world. They all have their own, each one has their own Flower fruit. No, their own wasp. 
Oh. So if that wasp were to get some kind of pathogen or disease and die off, that Dust. tree would go away. It would never and if this in the reverse is true, if the tree were to go away, the wasp. So this is another part of the circle of life. You know, the reason why people don't see something small and think it's not important, every little thing is. And when you think, I don't know if I want to eat wasps inside of figs. Well, let me tell you what, probably every fruit, vegetable thing you are eating has some little thing that we just can't see that's in there having its own little plant. They're little Lilliputians in our... Uh, hmm. Papaya, too. <laughs> and they're, they're, you can see they're, that one's a little bit smaller. They get up to about this big, but in the winter time, they start getting smaller and smaller. You know, they emerge smaller and smaller. And her husband's probably about this big. So anyway, so these guys asked in return for giving them the property at a very low price that we keep a historical example of the farming that was done. Hmm. The plants that are here are obviously plants that don't need soil. They're, they need a very nutrient poor. So they're mainly mangoes and key lime trees. Key lime trees like it the more brutal than ever. In fact, and this is a fact, if your key lime isn't producing, they tell you, go beat it up with a broom. Um, it likes it. So you can tell we haven't had rain for a while. This is a, a very, um, this is would be a disturbed area plant and it wasn't here before Irma. It is now because it has all this sunlight. This is called a potato tree. It is in the tomato, it is in the um, nightshade family. So that's the Serranus blue. And they're easy oh, to they identify because they fly right oh. on the ground. Right. That's they're it right, right on there. the undersides, Stop. but when they mm -hmm. fly, you can see the top side of their wing is a beautiful blue. Well, we've got a silver banded hair streak. It's a very rare butterfly. Now he's right there. Same way. They're beautiful oh. lime green. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's over now from the yep, bar. They're yes. beautiful. But he has a little you guys are seeing a butterfly that is really, really rare. One reason they are doing so well here in Penny Camp this year is after the hurricane, the balloon vine, your vines are coming out into the sun. So he's flying around, and I think That's there's more than one. Okay, the balloon vine is called Cardiospermum corindum. Cardio meaning heart. heart. Shape, the white heart yep. shape. Yep. And so this is what your silver banded hair streak is eating, is that Ooh, seed. He was wow, Susan, you're amazing. You brought us to be see endangered species. You mm. saw your snails, you saw your impaled um, uh, butterfly, which doesn't live anywhere else. So we were actually very concerned about the silver banded hair streak because. We hadn't seen it for three years. This is the number one place to see it, is at John Penny Camp. It hasn't been seen anywhere in Key Largo for three years until about two months ago.